thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this um, um, introduction. You're very kind. Um, good evening, everybody. I normally say good morning. I don't know why. Uh, but um, thank you very much for having me here. It's a pleasure and it's an honor to be presenting in front of all of you. And um, I would like to start by apologizing for people if I'm going to offend some of you because I'm politically incorrect. And uh, I do apologize for people if they have certain religious beliefs. Uh, and I do apologize for people who like Tony Abbott. Is he still our prime minister? <laughs> Is he the prime minister? I don't know who's the... the, the the current one, but anyway, uh, that's beside the point, it's trivial. Um, my name is Munjid, I'm an orthopedic surgeon and I live in Sydney. I quite enjoyed living in Canberra and at some stage I wanted to work in Canberra, uh, but uh, um, then things didn't work out um, and I spent a year and a half um, of my life training in Canberra, so I started my training here, so I'm very grateful to the city and uh, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I live in Sydney and um, um, I do my day-to-day -day work doing boring stuff like hip and knee replacement, and it's boring like bad shit. But, uh, <laughs> but I have um, great passion uh, uh, for um, helping people with disabilities, and, um, um, and I, I do apologize for saying that word because uh, disability is not a body disability. Disability is a disability of the mind. Uh, so I do um, help people who have lost a limb um, and uh, I had big passion about uh, this technology called OSI integration surgery where um, um, I had the inspiration from um, uh, Ronald Asprenage um, uh, when he did the Terminator, the movie, and I thought that's a great idea to make half human, half machine. Um, and at, at the age of 12, I watched that movie and um, uh, despite the whole uh, idea about making uh, the movie is to prevent people from making Terminators. I decided to pursue that career, um, and it was uh, it was a small hope. Um, but due to being in Australia and thankful to this country, I managed to achieve that. And and um, and now um, truly, I became the world leader in that field. And um, and people all around the world come and train. Um, in uh, Sydney and I travel all around the world uh, doing this surgery. Sadly, majority of the time for people who lost their limbs due to fight uh, um, because we continue to be stupid as human beings and continue to fight with each other. So um, my life didn't start there. Um, it was a completely different story. I was born in Baghdad um, and Baghdad was um, um, truly a beautiful city. Um, it was pretty much like Sydney. We had fireworks, they, uh, and we used to go on rooftops and uh, watch the fireworks. They, would, they were a bit different. They were real missiles hitting real planes. Um, <laughs> but it was fun. Um, I grew up um, in, in Iraq and um, uh, under the regime of Saddam Hussein. And he was a bad dictator. He uh, he was um, um, one of these people that believed in a certain ideology and um, had um, a plan to achieve his goals of uh, exterminating a lot of people. Uh, but he was fair. He didn't discriminate against um, people. So people talk about him killing the Shiites or killing the Kurds. It's all bullshit. He killed everybody. Um, <laughs> But if you mind your own business and you don't intervene, uh, in, interrupt uh, his uh, um, plans, uh, you can you can live your life, and um, uh, which I did, and um, I I grew up and I became a doctor and everything was fine. Um, I never thought about leaving Iraq. Um, similar to millions of people uh, around the world, like Syrians, um, I was in Damascus. Um, um, some time ago, and Damascus was a beautiful city, and um, I haven't seen a single Syrian person who would um, dream of leaving uh, their hometown. And look at what happened to them now. Ten million Syrians are refugees. Um, so everything was fine until that moment where I had to make the toughest decision in my life when I was uh, at the hospital, confronted with three busloads of army deserters, and we were ordered to uh, take their ears off uh, under anesthetics. Um, the head of the department refused, and um, uh, he ended up with a bullet in his head in the car park in front of everybody. And they turned to the rest of us, and they um, asked us to carry on. Um, 
I had to decide whether I would uh, refuse and end up with a bullet in my head. Uh, would I obey the command and live with guilt for the rest of my life? Um, or should I escape? And I managed to run away. I was one of the lucky ones because I had the um, access to my family's wealth and uh, connections inside the country. Um, and um, and it, life is unfair uh, because there are millions of people who um, got stuck there and are still stuck um, in uh, um, very bad places. Um, so I managed to escape from, um, uh, from Iraq and um, um, I left to Jordan. Jordan was not safe and uh, the only place on earth that would give uh, an Iraqi national with half decent passport a visa uh, was Malaysia. So I decided to take that trip to Malaysia hoping that there will be uh, something. I never thought about coming to Australia and the sequence of events uh, led uh, for me to meet two young men who were also escaping from Iraq um, and trying to seek asylum somewhere and uh, they had access to a people smuggler. Um, we met that person in KL and his name was Mahdi basically. He said to us um, when we called him, uh, come and meet us in Chowket, uh, which is where you buy fake Rolex watches and Louis Vuitton bags. And he said, I will be standing in front of um, uh, McDonald's uh, wearing a hat and a short and a shirt. Uh, we got out of the tax taxi and um, I saw this blonde guy, he looked like Steve Irwin. Uh, and I started talking to him in English and um, he was uh, surprised. Um, he turned up to be an Iraqi Kurd. Um, he took us aside and he said to us, um, uh, give me your money, um, uh, this amount of money, which was a large sum, and uh, your passports and I'll come back with uh, your next destination. As simple as that. And um, me being inquisitive, I asked him the question. He said, how do you expect me to trust you with, uh, tr uh, with our passports and this amount of money? Um, and he looked at me and he got very offended and he said, how dare you question my credibility? I'm a respectable smuggler. <laughs> so I, I had no choice. We gave him the money and the passports and he turned up to be a respectable smuggler, basically. <laughs> um, and he uh, told us that uh, um, you would go to Jakarta, that's your next destination, and this is a, um, a paper with a phone number on it, and uh, you um, um, contact the next person who would um, tell you where to go from there. So we were like sheep, uh, herded by this people smuggler. And I do understand the government policies and government uh, position on people smugglers, um, but um, the story is not always like that. Um, so we got to Jakarta and we called the number and another person um, was on the, on the end of the other line and um, um, he said go to this place and it said the outskirts of Jakarta and um, it was like an hour plus drive in the taxi and when we got to the hotel it was like a two star hotel, six story building, there were a lot of police cars outside uh, and um, in the foyer there were a lot of Middle Eastern looking people and it was very gloomy picture. They were very desperate. A lot of people, we started talking to people and a lot of them have lost all their money, all their savings, and uh, they were in desperate situation. They didn't know where they were going. Um, all escaping from, um, uh, or have escaped from their home countries, um, Middle Eastern people mostly, because um, that's where the ultimate stupidity is. Uh, it's very hot there and people are very passionate about stupid things. Um, but, um, the luck played a major role. Um, we sat there and the two guys who were with me um, uh, told people that this guy is a doctor. And I didn't realize that doctors are important until that moment. Um, so, and we were asking people how long you've been here for and they were saying that five months, six months, some of them nine months, um, and they were very desperate. I went to my room and I thought, what the hell have I done to myself? Uh, why do I deserve this um, and um, not knowing what's going to happen to me um, and then there was a knock on my door and the, and um, the smuggler came and he was wearing black and black and he was an Iraqi Kurd pretending to be a Shia uh, uh, Arab and speaking half Arabic very broken language and he said I pray to God that God will provide me with a with a religious leader or an Imam and uh, the Imam will come from Iran tomorrow 
And I prayed to God that God will provide me with a doctor. I knew the doctor. And I said, okay, what can I do for you? And he said, well, um, I have a plan. And I said, okay. And he said, I have a brand new boat that's going to Australia. Would you be interested in being on that boat? And I said, well, yes, I am. And that was the first time for me to know that uh, there is a chance of me to get to uh, Australia. Um, and he said, um, I have a problem. And I said, what's the problem? I said, this imam has uh, three daughters, and one of them is in her last trial minister of pregnancy. And uh, I want to make sure that the imam, um, you know, do his job by saving the boat throughout the journey. So he was a nice smuggler and was caring about the people. And I said, well, how can he look after the boat? He said, oh, he has this small clay piece of uh, mud. Um, that um, has uh, holy blood of Muhammad's grandson and he will sprinkle some of that um, dust on the waters and that will calm the waters and I said wow that's brilliant um, <laughs> and, uh, and he said but I don't want him to be distracted because um, um, I need someone to look after the daughter so he can look after the boat and I said that's very logical and I'm more than happy to look after the daughter <laughs> so um, I asked, and he said, what do you need? And I said, well, how many people on the boat? He says, it's a brand new boat. And I said, that doesn't answer my question. How many people on the boat? And he said, oh, maybe around 50. And I said, okay, well, I need uh, 100 drips, 100 um, normal saline bags, a lot of cannulas, and a lot of anti-emetic, like nausea and vomiting tablets and, um, and injections. And he said, okay, I'll get that. And I said, well, how can you get that? They are all medical supplies, and uh, you won't get them from a chemist. He said, don't you worry. I have a lot of connections here. Did you see all these cars, um, the police cars outside? And I said, yes, I did. And he said, they're all for my protection. And I said, fair enough. <laughs> So um, he came back the next day with all these supplies. The journey started uh, a day later, and um, we were in a bus, and there, was, uh, around, there were around 50 of us. The journey was um, 24 hours um, through Java, uh, uh, down to the uh, lower sh uh, no uh, l uh, south shore. Uh, we got there to an abandoned village, and we, dis uh, we discovered that this guy is not as respectable as the previous smuggler. We turned up to be... Um, three bus loads with 165 people. Um, we were loaded in the, in the boat, which was um, an, an old fishing boat uh, made of wood, and it was not even seaworthy. Uh, but there was no return. He had a lot of bodyguards uh, that were that short Indonesian guys with that tall machine guns. So, um, so it, the, the, the odds were against us. Um, they were stripping everybody from their belongings, money and, um, and, and gold, jewelry, whatever. And um, we were crammed on that boat like sardines, vertically. There was no space to sit down. The journey started, and to make it worse, once we got to international waters, it was early hours of the morning. Um, I was looking in the horizon, and there was this big uh, gray ship with very big white numbers on it uh, tailing us and um, I was wondering what this ship is doing and then we stopped and that ship came very close and a black dinghy came from that ship and joined us and this the Indonesian skipper on the boat looked at us and he said I go home and we said what and uh, he said okay this is TomTom -tom pilot navigation you know something that you can get in 1999 if you remember and uh, it was very rudimentary and he said go straight Christmas Island 30 hours miss mainland two weeks miss too far go back <laughs> okay. and that was our navigation direction uh, and uh, he left us and uh, went to the um, uh, to that frigate. Um, basically, uh, we were left to face the um, um, uh, elements on our own. Um, the journey was very scary. I can't explain it. I was. Um, I, I do have a bigger boat now uh, in in Sydney Harbour, and I was taking my uh, staff the other day just outside the uh, the heads and um, trying to give them uh, a sense of the experience that I faced in open seas. And uh, my PA turned green, basically. <laughs> so the swells were very high, um, very tall, and um, and um, it was raining all the time and uh, it was miserable but I obviously I was a horrible doctor I couldn't do a good job and I was putting drips everywhere and uh, by the end of the journey there were less than 10 people that are awake everybody was comatose so um, um, 
and people were basically on top of each other, uh, all drowned in their uh, vomit and urine. So the federal police came, and then the story changed. Uh, we got to Christmas Island with the help of an Iraqi sailor uh, that was escaped, uh, that escaped from the Iraqi Navy. And um, we got to Christmas Island. The federal police received us. Christmas Island was not a detention center back then. It was a beautiful island. It has phosphate and lime. And what, what's important in Christmas Island has um, a season of red crabs. And there were 100 million red crabs. Uh, the whole island was covered with red. And, I don't know why our government do not use Christmas Island as a, a nice touristic destination instead of a jail. Um, we were received very well by the federal police and I saw a true Australian hospitality um, as soon as I got off the boat. Um, I met the captain, uh, uh, the federal police captain on, um, on the island and he introduced me to his uh, deputy basically and he said, uh, this is my deputy, show him your scar. He had a scar like a, of a clavicle fracture on his um, shoulder and he said, I want you to go to this place. When you get out of detention center, this place called Tasmania, we chopped off one of his heads and a few of his fingers to look like this. I didn't understand that joke. <laughs> but I remember it very well. The other day I was... Um, I was giving a talk to, uh, to people in Launceston, and half of Launceston population were there, and they were all carrying the greeny flags and all that stuff, and welcoming refugees. And I looked at them, and I started my talk by saying, oh, you all had surgery. You all have one head. <laughs> that didn't go well. <laughs> Pauline Hansen's pictures came up <laughs> straight away. <laughs> anyway, um, so um, we... <laughs> We learned a lot of lessons, and you learn a lot of lessons in life and um, uh, from experiences you face. Um, the third day um, on the island, I stayed five days on the island, um, um, the um, uh, captain woke me up and he said, um, wake up, Munjadin. He called me by my name, which was amazing. Um, and I said, what can I do for you? Uh, he said, majority of the people on the boat with you are Muslims, aren't they? And I said, yeah, pretty much. And he said, so Muslims don't eat pig? And I said, yeah, they don't. And he said, do you realize that I've been feeding you ham sandwiches for the last three days? And I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, okay, I should tell them that. And I said, no. <laughs> so anyway, he was honest, not as honest as I am. And, um, and um, he told them, but he was stupid because the mullah and the imam started agitating people. And, um, and that was the first time I came to face um, a significant religious conflict because this guy, um, uh, that mullah or imam, didn't even read his book. Um, and he didn't know that um, um, if you're forced to do something and if you're not aware of what that is, then it's fine. And, um, and he started you know, carrying on about um, eating pig and being insulted in, um, um, in this nation. And um, um, I kind of told him to F off. But um, anyway, um, it didn't go well with his friends and uh, I had to pay for it in the detention center. Um, on the fourth day, I um, um, learned the most in important lesson in my life, basically, and made, who I am, made me who I am now. Um, I was asked by the federal police to um, uh, join them to intercept another boat that was uh, approaching Christmas Island. And um, we left on two barges. One barge was the captain and his Tasmanian deputy. And on the other barge, um, it was uh, myself with another official. Um, that guy, the official that was with me on the barge, didn't know who I am, didn't care who I was, and I met him for only that time. And, but he looked at me at a, as a human being. And uh, he started the conversation by asking, when we were um, in, on, in the sea, uh, he said, when was the last time you spoke to your family? And I said, well, just before I left Jakarta. And he said, so your parents do not know whether you're alive or dead? And I said, no, they don't. And, um, and we were not allowed to use uh, any method of communication. Um, so he said, sit on the ground, um, hide yourself, don't show, uh, don't let anyone see you, and don't you dare tell anyone what I'm going to do. And I said, okay. And uh, he pulled out a satellite phone from his pocket, and he said, dial the number, call your family, and tell them that you're safe. 
Now this guy didn't have to do this because he put his career, his job on the line and he broke the law uh, just to help another human being. And I'm forever grateful to this man. And every time I tell this story, um, uh, my eyes go watery because, um, uh, because of him, my mum lived till the day uh, she saw me when I was released from the detention center. So I wish that one day I can meet him and thank him. And because of him, I am who I am now, um, because I took an oath on myself that um, at any time, if someone come and ask me for help, I would do it and I would not hesitate, uh, because you may never get that chance um, again. So anyway, the, um, we intercepted the boat and turned up that I was useless because it was filled with Vietnamese people and my Vietnamese is worse than my English. <laughs> so. Um, on the fifth day, we were taken to uh, Christmas uh, to uh, the mainland, and um, I was a bit pissed off because um, I was the last person to leave because I was interpreting for people, and um, and the captain told me, "Don't don't be upset. Um, enjoy it while you can here because uh, um, the the situation in um, in the detention center is completely different." And he was right. So when we got there, the minute we were handed over f from the federal police to um, the ACM, or whatever you call them, Australian Correction Management or American Correction Management, um, we were treated like animals. Um, the first thing that happened to me, I was given a toothpaste, uh, toothbrush and um, a pair of thongs and a towel, and um, I had to stand to be marked with um, 982, a number with a permanent marker on my shoulder. That reminded me of some previous historic events. Um, that was my name for the rest of the time in the detention center. Uh, and um, uh, I lost my identity. Uh, I was treated like an animal. Um, I can tell you um, a lot of things about the detention center. Uh, we were locked inside compounds from within the compound between 7 p.m. and 7 a.m. We had to do head counts four times a day. Um, and we had to queue in the heat of the sun for two, three hours to be head counted. Um, we were given um, spaghetti and uh, mince meat that's colorless and tasteless for uh, the period, uh, no changes. Um, I don't want to sound pity, but these things get into you uh, after a while. Um, all of that I can understand, but one thing I cannot digest uh, and comprehend. Um, at some stage, we were 1,000. 252 people inside the detention center. There were 117 minors among us. Uh, a lot of these minors or children uh, were unaccompanied minors. Uh, and they were locked from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, in tents behind barbed wire with no surveillance cameras among adults who are incarcerated. This is wrong and it has to stop. It's still going on till this day. Australia is the only country on this planet that I know of that does this to human beings. And we, um, as Australians, we have a duty of care toward other human beings. Okay? I, I just cannot understand how politicians give their children a kiss goodbye to school every day and they can do that to other people's children. Um, and I hope that one day uh, the day will come that we don't have these kind of atrocities in our land because we are much better than this. Um, the detention center was hell on earth. I can give you an, a comparison uh, between the detention center and our prison system. Because I was a naughty boy, I was uh, obviously uh, outspoken and uh, I didn't break any laws, but uh, I was singled out as a troublemaker. So uh, I had the pleasure of visiting many Australian prisons and jails. Um, um, Derby Lockup was my favorite. Every other weekend, I spent a couple of days there. Um, but I spent some time in maximum security prison and, and Karatha jail. And, um, and I tell you what, um, um, Australian jail system is brilliant. It was fantastic. It was like heaven. Um, I was treated like a human being. I was called by my name. Um, I was given clean clothes uh, as compared to the only clothes that I came on the boat uh, with. Um, and um, I was treated with dignity. So I strongly recommend the jail system in Australia, by the way. 
And what's more important than all of that, I had access to the outside environment. I could speak uh, over a phone uh, and I could watch the news and know what's going on outside. Uh, could read the newspaper. Um, and as soon as the, um, the Department of Immigration realized that I'm using the phone, they took me back to the detention center. And um, this time they um, decided to put me in a box. And um, it was called the suicide watch box. And it's like a one and a half by two and a half meters, mattress on the floor, no pillow, no sheets, so I don't hang myself. And um, a, a fluorescent light that's purple in color, 24 seven and a camera. And there was a small door, uh, hole in the door that big, 10 cent piece uh, that I can see the outside environment. They kept me for 22 hours a day uh, in there, and they take me out for two hours for recreation. Um, and um, I didn't question. Um, I, I had to go on a hunger strike, I must admit, uh, asking for my book that I brought with me in Iraq, my only companion from Baghdad, uh, which was Last Anatomy. And to be honest, thanks to Philip Roddock and uh, the detention manager, uh, I read that book from cover to cover so many times that as soon as I got out of the detention center, I sat my exam and I scored very high in anatomy. <laughs> so. Um, I spent so long in the in isolation, and uh, and every time I asked them what am I doing here, and they said, ah, oh, you've been to jail, so we need to rehabilitate you. And I said, oh, that's great. Um, anyway, eventually I was released, and um, um, the visa came, and and uh, the the manager at the detention center obviously didn't like me, and uh, we didn't get along. Um, I caused him a lot of embarrassment actually, um, and. Um, the group that I was supposed to leave with uh, were flown to, to Brisbane, and he came to me in the early hours of the morning, and he gave me the visa, and he said, well, um, I decided that you can go here. And I said, here where? And he said, we'll open the door for you. And I said, okay, that's fine. Um, and I learned the lesson throughout my life that um, I always look at it as a glass half full. So this guy was trying to punish me by releasing me in the middle of nowhere in Curtin, which is like 40 kilometers south of Derby, if, uh, if you want to know where it is. Um, and, um, and I looked at it and I said, what an opportunity. So I took the bus from Derby to Broome, from Broome to Perth, to Adelaide, to Melbourne, to Sydney. And it was the best trip in my life, basically. <laughs> and I bet you, none of you has done that. <laughs> so um, I decided that I wasted a lot of um, um, taxpayers' money by um, um, eating and drinking and pooing and doing nothing. Um, mind you, I met Philip Product inside a detention center uh, when he was on his secret visit to the detention center, and, um, and I had um, sympathizers from within the guards who came and told me, and, um, and we, we stood in front of the door and, and said, well, we know that Philip Product is here, we'd like to meet him. And, um, and funny enough, um, I mean, some people are so brainwashed, and, uh, and I dare to say that, because when I asked him the questions, and I can't uh, quote exactly his words, but uh, my understanding with my poor English from what he said when I asked him about the children in the detention center, um, um, in, it was in the sense of that these people broke the law by coming to Australia, so if we let them uh, have it easy, then they might grow, and break, um, grow up and break the law again, which was stupid ideology. Um, and, and I asked him as well, if, um, if, um, why would you spend $160 per head on us um, and giving this money to an American um, uh, company to detain us? And um, uh, we were guarded by people um, that do not even speak English uh, or write English. And um, children among us um, um, are losing time without education. People among us are getting frustrated and, um, and eventually a lot of them will be released to the community and there will be a negative impact on the community because they will be all post-traumatic um, uh, distorted and um, and he looked at me and uh, he said what do you suggest and I said well why don't you just tag us uh, with uh, electronic tags spend that money on Australian police put us in the middle of nowhere in um, in Uluru or uh, in Alice Springs and in, uh, in Mackay in in places that need people um, and we can um, farm the land and uh, learn the culture and um, learn the language and um, uh, and be helpful and he looked at me he just laughed and um, 
But, uh, you know, I mean, these, these kind of things still happening. Um, um, so, anyway, eventually I managed to uh, get a job um, and I, I was released on the 26th of August 2000 and um, I received my first paycheck on the 1st of November, so I do apologize for spending taxpayers' money for two months. Um, uh, funny enough, I was knocking on every single hospital's door asking for a job and nobody would hire me and, uh, and then I realized that you have to go to the Centrelink and uh, print out your CV and, um, and I, I learned the system very quickly and I send my, my CV everywhere and uh, I got a job within two weeks, uh, basically as a doctor in Mildura Hospital. Uh, mind you, my first job in Australia was a toilet cleaner, and I quite loved it, and um, and um, and I quite enjoy it because I was brought up that job is an honour. If you don't have a job and you can't work, you don't have an honour. And uh, a lot of people share the same ideology like me, and um, I, I always laugh at. Um, 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 the politicians in our country when they talk about these economic migrants and about these that want to come to this country and bludge on the system. Um, and look at the Vietnamese, look at the, the Italians, look at the, the Greeks. They built this country and they all came as migrants. And before them, look at the Irish, look at the Scottish, look at the English. Um, so um, so it, is, it is very embarrassing that we keep saying these things. Um, just to cut the story short, and I do apologize, I know everybody want to go home. Um, eventually, um, I got to where I got, and, um, and I feel very passionately about this country. I'm very grateful to Australia. Australia is home, Sydney is home, and I would defend it with every um, um, uh, possible power that I, uh, that I have. And that's why I serve in the uh, Royal Australian Air Force um, Reserve. Um, and it hurts when I see that we're using our forces uh, to um, um, attack um, people who are coming to us seeking refuge. This is not what our military is made for. Um, um, attacking <coughs> harmless people, uh, turning them back uh, to where? The unknown. These people have spent all their, all their money uh, getting on that boat. And, and I've seen it with my own eyes. They have nothing left. And when you turn them back, where do they go? Nobody knows. Um, why would we have a shade of secrecy about our um, immigration policies if they, are, if they are kosher? Why do we do that? Uh, why don't we become transparent? Um, Australia doesn't have a Bill of Rights yet. And I think it's time to have that. Um, we have a lot of hard work to do. And, um, and we are much better than what our governments and our politicians are um, um, trying to do um, with us, unfortunately. Um, we are the power. You, we have the votes. We can tell our members of parliament that what you're doing and what you're saying is wrong, okay? Um, and we can shape the future. Um, I have a lot of hope that things will change. And I'll tell you what, when I travel overseas, I go and give a lot of lectures um, in, in the field of medicine that I work uh, in, and people don't know that I'm a refugee. Uh, they think I'm a dinky diosi. <laughs> It's so funny. <laughs> but um, uh, the first thing they say to me when um, we break the ice with a glass of champagne, um, aren't you ashamed of being Australian the way you treat human beings? And ironically, a lot of the time this comes from people from within Germany. But I know why, because they have been bitten. They have seen it firsthand, okay? People in the 30s didn't come by force. They came by votes. They came because they played on ignorance. They played on radical right-wing ideologies that are destructive, um, filled with hatreds, okay? And we don't wanna be that. We don't wanna do that, okay? It's been 70 years or, or 80 years or 90 years, so we have forgotten what happened in Europe that time. And um, there is a big move with, um, with people with these kind of ideologies and they think they are cool by being nationalistic and patriot. That's the biggest load of bullshit because after all, we're all human beings. We have the same blood types, believe me, and we all, if we bleed, it will be red, except me, maybe I have green blood, but anyway. <laughs>
it's because I spent too much time in detention center. Um, um, I have three dreams in my life, and, um, and I think I'll achieve at least one of them. The first one is to get osseointegration integration surgery available to the rest of the world, um, to people who are needed at most, to people who cannot afford it, in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, um, people who lost their limbs um, due to um, explosive devices. Uh, and I think I can achieve that. The second big dream that I have is to see the day where Australia have a fast train from Brisbane to, Sydney, to, <laughs> to Melbourne. Oh. Passing by Canberra. <laughs> <laughs> and that tells you something about our stupid politicians. No one has the guts to start this kind of plan because they all think very short that this plan will not extend beyond my time and someone else might claim the credit for it. Australia is the only developed nation that doesn't have a fast train, mind you. Okay? Um, so we need that. And the third dream, which is, I think is impossible in my lifetime, is that we all grow up and have tolerance toward each other and acceptance. Thank you. <laughs>